Welcome to the Spring 2024 New Jersey Film Festival Filmmaker Q&A series. We'll have a number of these over the next few weeks to promote our 42nd annual uh, biannual festival that started out in 1982. And we're very proud to be continuing to show really important, thought-provoking cinema to New Jersey audiences. And I've been running this since 1982 when I was a graduate student. It's evolved quite a bit. Um, but we really have a very important filmmaker here today who's going to talk about her film, Join or Die, which is a documentary film that focuses on the studies done by an academic who's based at Harvard, and his name was Robert Putnam. And Robert Putnam did a very important study on the state of democracy in the United States and about civic engagement. So I'd like to introduce you to the co-director and the producer of this film, Join or Die, Rebecca Davis. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having us. And I'd also like to introduce you to two of the judges who were participants that helped select this film. And we have Sarah Ventola, who's right next to me in the Hollywood Squares here. And then we have Alyssa Chirchia. She was also one of the judges. So they're going to help ask questions to Rebecca. But since I'm the director, I get to ask the very first one. And I have so many. And I think what I'll do is I'll also send you a written, and we'll do a written interview too. I have a feeling we'll do that as well. Um, Pete was a student of um, um, Professor Putnam's courses. I mean, how did how did this film come to be? How, how did it come together? Yes. So um, my co-director is actually my brother, uh, Pete. We are a brother-sister uh, director-producer team on this documentary. Uh, we had no intention of kind of ever working together in film, but um, things kind of, uh, you know, just came together around a conversation uh, we were having in 2017. Wow. So this a five-year project that we've been working on. My, my brother was a student of Robert Putnam's who uh, famously wrote this book called Bowling Alone that came out in 2000. It was all about the decline in civic life in America, things like bowling leagues, um, things like the Rotary Club, book clubs, local NAACP chapters. And he kind of charted that, you know, all of these things were in decline and, um, you know, said that this was not going to be great for our democracy because these were the places that we learned democratic um, skill building. Um, and at that time in 2017, I was working as a journalist um, at NBC News, and I was covering a lot of the symptoms of Bob's work on the ground. Um, so things like rising suicide rates, school shootings, um, opioid addictions, a lot of things that seem to be the symptoms of, you know, our fraying social fabric. And so I said to my brother, you know, I, you know, I think this might be time for us to kind of get um, Bob's ideas back into the conversation. Do you think we could approach him about being a documentary? And he was his his final year of teaching. Um, he was a professor for many years at Harvard. We said, how do we take this Harvard class, get it into a, a you know hour and a half long documentary, and and share it with a much broader audience? Yeah, it's it's a really timely film in so many ways. And I felt as I was watching it that. Um, uh, one of the things that struck me was that there were some really interesting animations that are meant to kind of propel the film forward. And the opening animation is just wonderful. And I guess I wanted to ask you how you hooked up with Mark Lopez, since he does the majority of that, I, I, I assume. Yeah, so Mark Lopez is this incredibly talented animator out of Austin, Texas. He runs a animation studio called Silkworm Studios. And I came across a short that he had done as we were looking for, for an animator for this project um, called Segregated by Design. Um, it's a great short that's still up on Vimeo. And I really liked his style because he worked with a lot of photographs. Um, you know, one of these ones behind me, This you're not seeing this in motion, but mm. you know, he colorized this photo and, you know, he had like a kind of very original fun aesthetic that really brought history to life. And mm. what we wanted to do with the animation, the film is not just kind of slowly move, you know, archival photos across screen as, as you often see in traditional documentary, but 
um, we really wanted to create like a lively American scrapbook that, you know, not only looked at our civic decline, but celebrated our rich civic past, mm. um, you know, which has been the reason that so many of the gains that that we've won and all the good things uh, that we have done in our country, you know, came out of um, out of this, this civic life. And we, so we wanted someone that could really take that that idea of the American scrapbook and run with it. And, and Mark Lopez definitely did that. Wonderful. Uh, Alyssa, you get to ask another question. Yeah, so um, I really enjoyed the documentary and the film. And the one thing that I was wondering was that, did you have any clubs or organizations that you were a part of either growing up or currently that um, you know you enjoyed or helped inspire the film? Totally. So, um, you know, I think one of the reasons in the first place that my brother and I were drawn to this is we did grow up in a very civic town. Um, so we grew up in a town, Falls Church, Virginia. It's outside Washington, D.C. And, you know, all the things that Bob were writing about, those things were still vibrant in our town. You know, the Rotary Club sponsored the local baseball and soccer teams. And, um, you know, there was strong religious life in our community. And as we went out from our town, you know, into our lives in other places, we saw that, you know, that had was really the exception that we were still experiencing kind of this strong civic uh, community. So, you know, it was already something that was personal to us from our growing up. Um, but then over the course of making this film, um, I was actually seeing some of the trends kind of simultaneous to, to working on the research, which was um, while I was at NBC, I was organizing um, NBC's first uh, digital union um, for their digital uh, journalists at NBC News in New York City. We had about 200 of us that were organizing together and, and won our union. Um, but, you know, what I was experiencing during that time, I was producing this film kind of on the side on my nights and weekends, um, initially working at NBC during the day as a journalist, organizing with my coworkers outside of work. Um, and, you know, we were seeing that it was hard to get people to come out of meeting, come out to meetings, you know, because this, as I was seeing in the data that I was researching, you know, and working on this film, um, you know, those were civic muscles that a lot of us, you know, haven't, hadn't worked in a long time. Um, so, and, and we use the, the term in the film club very broadly, you know, Big Ten Club. So we include organizing together with your neighbors or coworkers or family, um, you know, in many different forms, including religious, including unions. Um, and Bob's work definitely charted, you know, the decline of unions, which we're, we are now starting to see kind of a slow turnaround as we've seen historic wins with UAW recently and a lot of um, teachers union wins. But um, so so I was, you know, doing that, that organizing work along alongside of kind of researching it and working on it in the film. We, we, we were on strike in earlier this year, and luckily the strike only lasted a week, but there were significant gains for uh, part-timers, graduate students. And so, yeah, I mean, definitely see that movement uh, upticking again. Uh, oh, Sarah, your turn. Yeah, I really enjoyed um, watching your film. Um, so one question I have was, did you uh, go into it thinking that you were gonna focus on bowling and like veering it off in that direction or did you have a more general focus in the beginning? I mean, so Bob, you know, Bob is a prolific academic, you know, he's, he's written many, many books, we could only focus in on a few of them. And, and the one that in, in the US, at least that he's often, you know, most known for is this book bowling alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we had a sense that it would be, you know, playing a prominent role. Um, we're excited, though, that we we're able to also hi highlight, you know, some of his earlier research that's maybe lesser known outside of ac academic circles, which is research he had done in Italy. Um, which kind of, that was early in his career before he turned his focus um, to the US. So we were, we were excited that we were able to highlight kind of this early research where he was looking at Italian democracy and uh, found that what made Italian, the book is Making Democracy Work, his early book, and what he found in his early early years as, a, as an academic and researcher that it was not how the governments uh, were set up in who was studying Italian regional governments. And it was not necessarily how, how strong their economies were, but it was, did they have choral societies and, and soccer clubs uh, that were strong? And so that kind of foundation in his academic life 
helped when he turned to the U.S. and saw, hey, you know, I'm, I'm noticing that our, our numbers are declining here. And I know from my work in Italy that that's not going to be good. Um, so we're excited that we were able to kind of broaden out um, for the audience uh, some of his other research outside of Bowling Alone. And then, you know, we also got to highlight six community groups um, that are kind of doing Bob's academic research, but on, on the ground. They're the ones kind of doing the work. So we highlighted a, a cycling group in Atlanta, an Odd Fellows Lodge in Texas. And early in the project, as we were researching these community groups to follow, I was like, okay, do we fall into the, the shtick of covering bowling league? And I was kind of resisting, resisting. <laughs> and of course, you know, I came across this, this bowling group in Portland that had started informally and went as far as to buy their own bowling alley. And I was like, all right, we've got to, we've got to lean into it. And, um, uh, you know, I, I was glad we did because they, uh, they really, you know, kind of embody the spirit of, um, you know, this turnaround that, that Bob is trying to, um, trying to encourage which makes him interesting as an academic, I will say too, he does not just want to put out the research. Um, you know, he really wants to evangelize a turnaround in, in these numbers um, and has has been doing that since Bowling Alone came out and continues, you know, in this tour with us now on this film to to keep keep pushing for people to believe that we can turn around these trends. Well, you know, the, the other great thing about your documentary is you lined up these amazing interviewers. I mean, the interviewees are just amazing from Hillary Clinton to, I wrote them all down, Pete Buttigieg is in there. You also have Mike Lee. So it's not just, you know, just the liberals. It's it's trying to be balanced, which we really like. And I just wondered how complex it is to line all these things up. And COVID must have thrown a wrench in the machinery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think part of our ability to get some of these big deal names was that, I, you know, I think it speaks to how much Bob's work has really influenced their their thinking about political and civic life. Um, and I think, you know, it, we were also catching them at a time where this issue every year as we're working to, on the the film was just becoming that much ur more urgent. So, you know, while COVID was definitely a surprise, we started in 2017 and COVID hit obviously in 2020, mm. you know, so we could have never seen that we were going to hit a global pandemic in the, the middle of production. But I think that brought this issue that much more front of mind, you know, the need to, to rejuvenate our civic life. Cause I think we saw, you know, how much we missed when we couldn't get together with people um, you know, in, in person for, for those, you know, year or two years. Um, and, you know, we, we ran this great social experiment during that time. Is it the same meeting up on, on Zoom? And I, I don't think any of us need research to know it was not the same doing our birthdays over Zoom or happy hours over Zoom. Maybe it was fun for the first three. And then, um, you know, we all wanted to be back in person, hugging, hugging our grandparents or our, our friends. Um, you know, and I think, you know, now the film, premiered this year in March at South by Southwest in 2023. And I think it's really been released in this moment where, um, you know, people are, are, are primed and eager to have this, this conversation about where we go from here. I, I like the way that the film also has this kind of almost false ending an hour in and well, the film could have ended here, Pete says in the voiceover narration. And yet you, then you do go into how COVID impacted on all, all of this and really did impact civic engagement even more. But enough of me. Uh, Alyssa, it's your turn again. Please ask away. Um, I was just curious in in general more about um, the graphics and the visuals. Like I was saying, it was, it was just amazing for me to watch. I'm somebody who really enjoys visuals, especially with documentaries and how you were saying, you know, you didn't want to just have it kind of like archival pictures flashing. I just wanted to ask, how do you think that kind of matches with the theme of the documentary or just enhances it more just because I just want to know more about the graphics and visuals. Totally. Yeah. I mean, in, in addition to like just creatively and design wise thinking of it, you know, as an American scrapbook, um, I think the other thing we wanted to do is make an alternative textbook with a bunch of people's faces that no one would recognize. Mm. Um, so these everyday heroes that half of our film is a bunch of people in photos sitting around tables. Um, but that is the reality of, you know, what built our history, you know, behind Rosa Parks sitting on the bus and Martin Luther King making his famous speeches was decades and decades of church groups and unions and community organizations, NAACP chapters, where there are a bunch of, of people that 
you know, built the civil rights movement, um, you know, who we who we don't see, who are behind kind of the big names of these events, who are going week in, week out, you, often multiple times a week to meetings. Um, and I think, you know, in what we can learn now and looking back to the past is it's going to take a lot of us, um, you know, getting ourselves into rooms together, sitting around tables, um, you know, working out. Uh, the changes we want to see and and how to push for those changes. Um, and so, you know, we really wanted to celebrate, you know, like these guys on Al's background, um, you know, no one recognizes them, but they are doing the work of our democracy. And I, I think the other thing is, you know, this is the big thing in, in bowling alone that Bob wants to bring up is it's not necessarily only meeting over political issues, um, where we build, you know, his his famous idea that he's popularized is this idea of social capital, which is, you know, the trust and reciprocity we build with our neighbors that we need if we want to, you know, work together uh, collectively in a democracy to kind of uh, co-create our future. Um, and, you know, his thing is, you know, we have to do the work of building those bonds over, you know, shared um, shared passion and shared joy, and it might be in a bowling league. If we then want to get out to the school board meeting and be able to work together well, it's going to go a lot better if we're working with people we know from the bowling league than a bunch of a bunch of strangers because we're going to already have built up some of that some of that trust. So we want to show kind of both of those sides of things, um, and I think you know we want to do that also in the groups that we highlighted in modern day. So showing a bike club and a bowling league. Um, you know, and not just our groups where we're getting together to meet over explicitly political issues. What about Moms for Liberty? I mean, I don't know if I would want to interview them, but, you know, if is that that's kind of almost an obstacle to civic engagement in some ways with without getting too heavy into it, because I, I think it's disruptive, not really meant to be coalescing in any way. What, what do you think? I, I mean... Yeah, I mean, we are definitely living through, we we don't go into this research of Bob's, so we are living through, you know, outside the civil, civil war, like the most polarized time in our country. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and of course, people also always bring up, you know, the KKK was a club. Right. You know, what, what do you say to that? And, and you know, Bob's, Bob's uh, analogy he'll often use is, um, you know, it's you need to think about it like a hammer a hammer can be used to hit someone in the head or a hammer can be used to kind of build a house <laughs> um and that is certainly true about our clubs and and civic life um and you know our hope with the film is that we are just you know inspiring people to either double down in groups they're already involved in or if they're not involved get off the sidelines because the more organizations we have out there to catch people who aren't involved in anything who are maybe feeling lonely and isolated the less likely kind of these more extreme groups will be able to catch catch people who are feeling lonely and isolated and anxious for someone to say, hey, you belong. Um, you know, if you're already a member of the Rotary and a local religious organization and a sports team, when the KKK comes knocking on your door and says, oh, you yeah. know, come join us, you're going to be less vulnerable to get pulled into kind of these more, more extreme ways of, um, of getting together. Really, really said. Uh, Sarah, your turn. Um, so I know you mentioned COVID and how that reminds us that we want to be closer together. Um, and obviously, I definitely agree with that. So my question is, how, did you, I mean, maybe not necessarily in research or anything, but do you think that that's actually reflected in the actions that people are taking now? Or do you think it's kind of about the same as it was before COVID? Yeah, I mean, that is the big open question. And our documentary is entering a world where we all need to be asking that question. And, um, and we don't know the answer yet. But, you know, I think there's kind of uh, a way to look at this moment we're in as a really exciting moment, because we can build something totally different. Um, the way we all work has totally changed and way more rapidly than it would have if we hadn't, you know, experienced COVID and all been forced to work from home. You know, tons more people are working from home, you know, than ever before in our history and, and probably will not go back to the, to the office, at least in the way that we did before. Um, but instead of seeing that as a way to say, oh, is that going to just push us, you know, into more of an isolation crisis, we'll be home all day. I think we can see it as 
as an opportunity. Um, a lot of people used to spend two hours a day commuting, one hour to work in the morning, one hour back home at night. That's two hours back that could now be pushed into to civic life. If you're working from home, it's going to be a lot easier to walk five minutes down the street at the end of your workday and get mm-hmm. involved in something in, in your community. Um, and I think offices are going to need new ways to kind of build social capital and team building. Um, you know, so I think we can think creatively about policy ideas. You know, what if we move to a four day work week where we're working from home, but on the fifth day, we're out with our, our coworkers doing something in person, you know, as a service day. Um, you know, and I just, you know, I hope this film is coming, uh, in a moment where people are, you know, kind of thinking creatively and not just seeing this as, you know, a done deal that it's going to go further down this path of isolation, um, but see it as an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, that you, your film points out so many um, directions that the country can go in, and we're at an inflection point. And I think that's why your film is really timely and, and important to see, because it can stimulate the mind in terms of uh, well, do I want to be socially active? I mean, the group that I work with uh, uh, is, it was originally called the Rutgers Film Co-op. It was a cooperative and it was a place where people came together to watch movies together. So it, it is a club ultimately, mm-hmm. but uh, the pandemic changed that. We used to come together and we'd watch and judge films together. And now mm-hmm. everything is done remotely, but we do get together when we screening films and there is some interaction that I think will continue to ramp up. So, you know, it's it's self-reflexive in so many ways. And I think hopefully the next few years we'll, we'll do more interaction, more movie watching together. I think that would be really wonderful. Yeah. I, I wanna take this time now to share screen to show our audience how they can come and see this film. Now, Rebecca, I can't remember if you're gonna come or if Pete is gonna come to the actual screening uh, i think it's still in the work we should be able to confirm confirm that soon yeah, um, yeah. It's and that's why we that's why we do this q a too because you know the folks that can come that are going to watch it virtually at least we'll have this not only as a way to kind of get them interested in the film but also to go back to it to see what they thought of the movie in in context so um anyway l- let me share screen how am i going to do this i guess I have to do this first. And so we're going to go to the desktop and share. And hopefully everybody can see this. Yes, this is our homepage and and the picture in the background is our screening space. And we recently had the website redesigned by um, one of my interns who's now an advisor to the group and he did a great job. So when you get to our homepage, which is njfilmfest.com, you just wanna click on current events and Um, My wonderful cat, Miss Amy, is being uh, immortalized because she passed away earlier this year. And so she was a really wonderful cat. And we want to pay tribute to her by using her uh, image as our uh, festival art. And so when you get here, you're just going to have a placeholder. And this tells you when the festival is going to take place between January 26th and February 18th. And Join or Die is going to be playing on Saturday, February 10th, uh, online for 24 hours and in person at 7 p.m. So there will be an in-person show at our nice space, Voorhees Hall, Room 105 at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Tickets are $15, and that's good for online and in person. And in fact, we have a, a number of really crazy cinephiles that will watch the film during the day and then come to the actual screening to interact with the filmmaker when they're there. So it's a really nice per, uh, perk that you get by buying a ticket. You click on the red button and it bounces you to our Eventive website. Um, Eventive is our streaming provider, but we use this also as the place to buy tickets for the in-person show too. And this is our welcome page, which has basic information again. And, uh, you know, you can see the sponsors and the staff. And then the key thing to punch is schedule. If you want to get a generic kind of view of the festival in linear form, or to go to tickets. And that's the catalog page, which has every single film that we're showing in here. And in order to see Join or Die, you would click on this photograph, another bowling group that we use as an image, and you just click on the pre-order button. And the pre-order button will ask you to log in. You'll have to create an account, and then you'll be able to purchase a ticket. And the ticket is good 
for you to watch the film for 24 hours online. And that starts at 12 midnight Eastern time. So it actually starts earlier if you're in on the Pacific um, if you're in California, it's going to start at 9 p.m. the day before. So that kind of throws people off a little bit, but it is 24 hours. If you start watching the film at 1130 on that day in the evening, you still have 24 hours to finish it. So it's um, 24 hours to start watching, and then you have another 24 hours to finish watching. So um, a couple of other things to point out to you, go back to the festival site, are at all access pass is a great deal. It's like half price. So if you want to watch a lot of movies, you buy the all access pass, it'll save you close to a hundred dollars, something like that. Um, and uh, you want to check us out, you go to the menu and you can click all sorts of things like the film guide, which will allow you to see each individual film have their own um, web page and uh, join or die. And there's Robert Putnam on this one, which gives you an overview in one of the collages that we highlighted too. So I'm going to stop sharing. And that's how folks can come to our, our festival. We've been doing this for a long time. We were first a revival festival that showed films exclusively on film because that's the only way you could show a movie. And now we've evolved where we're really championing indie, independent films for the last two decades and really proud of that. So I want to thank you, all of you, Alyssa, Sarah and Rebecca, thank you so much for hanging out with us. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see you at the, at the in-person screening. That would be a wonderful opportunity. Thanks so much, everyone. Hope to see some of you there. Bye.